Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Kevin Swain, and I'm the student president for the William F. Buckley Jr. program here at Yale. Uh, before I introduce our guests, just like to say a quick word about our program. Uh, the mission of the Buckley program is to promote intellectual diversity on Yale's campus. We accomplish this goal in a number of ways, uh, including speaker series, firing line debates, seminars, conferences, and sponsoring summer internships for Yale students. Uh, we hope you'll visit our website uh, and learn more about upcoming events at buckleyprogram.com. Um, we'd like to give a big thank you to, to Todd Jorgensen for uh, making this event possible. Um, to introduce our guests now, uh, Senator Jeff Flake has nearly two decades of experience on Capitol Hill uh, in both the Senate and the House of Representatives. Heralded as an ideal public servant in the New York Times, Flake is renowned for his bravery in speaking out against the current administration, his principled stands on spending and free trade, and his shrewd negotiations and bipartisanship on complicated issues such as immigration. A traditionally conservative Republican, Flake defended the core values and principles of his party and revealed how they're currently under threat. In his New York Times bestselling book, Conscious of a Conservative, which the Washington Post described as the single largest act of political bravery in the Trump era. His eloquent, impassioned, and headline-making retirement speech delivered from the Senate floor further condemned the new normal in politics. He's a current contributor for CBS News, where he'll be launching a new series called Common Ground, which focuses on opposing groups coming together. Please join me in welcoming Senator Jeff Flake. Thank you, Kevin. It's, uh, it's great to be here. I really appreciate it. I appreciate the William F. Buckley program for the invitation and for Todd Jorgensen, who unfortunately had to go to class, so he's not here, but our friend Denny Barney is here from Arizona as well, and I appreciate uh, all of you being here. I uh, especially, uh, I'm especially honored to be here because of William F. Buckley. I had the privilege of getting to know him during the 1990s. Uh, when I came back uh, to Arizona uh, from Washington to run the Goldwater Institute, uh, we decided to give away something every year called the Goldwater Award. And uh, one year we decided to, to invite Margaret Thatcher to see if she would come. Uh, she agreed. And uh, so we thought oh, we will have to make this even better and see if we could get others together. So we asked William F. Buckley if he would come and be the master of ceremonies. And he agreed. And I, I sent him a letter. I'd heard that he played the, the harpsichord. And uh, we uh, had the facilities there. I thought it would be neat for him to uh, step away from his master of ceremonies duties at one point, maybe during the dinner, and, and play a number. So I sent him a note asking him to. And he sent this note back to me. He said, this was dated April 15th, 1994. Dear Mr. Flake, you are very kind to relay your invitation yet again. My problem is that I have undisciplined fingers, he said. <laughs> and the combination of that and the awful stage fright I get when playing the harpsichord results in mortification. At, at la as last week when I played at a fundraiser for the Washington Bach Institute, he said I made the mistake of recording my 20 minutes and was so horrified on listening to it uh, the next day that I have sworn off. But if you have an instrument around, I'd be delighted to play personally for you. Cordially, William F. Buckley. <laughs> and it was, it was a, a great thing to get that. And when he came out to Arizona, he had to write his column. And it was due the next day. And he, he gave me a call, uh, frantic, uh, early one morning and said, I've lost my column in the ethernet somehow, can you help me? I'm not a computer scientist, <laughs> but I, I thought I could go help him. So we traipsed around Phoenix going into computer shop to computer shop to retrieve his column. Finally, he, uh, he gave up doing it. He said, take me to your office, which I did. He entered into uh, my office, uh, locked the door, and 20 minutes later came out and said, I've finished, can you send this off? And I was, I was so impressed <laughs> with that. Uh, but uh, he said during that time when I was taking him around, I told him how much I admired his writings, especially his writings about sailing. Uh, growing up on a, on a dry, dusty ranch, that impressed me. Uh, his, his tales, as many sailing books. And, and I told him how much I, I wanted to sail, that I wasn't a sailor, but uh, aspired to be one. And he said, well, you should come and sail with me. 
And I thought he was just being kind because I was helping him out with his computer. Uh, but uh, later on, I got an email from him saying, why haven't you taken me up on it? And so I, I found my way to New York on something else, and he said, just meet me at the, the Stamford train station, and we'll go off. And so I did. He met me there at the train station, took me to his house in Stamford. Uh, we uh, watched the evening news, CBS, Dan Rather, I remember. <laughs> and, uh, and then we went to the boat, and as he did virtually every Friday night in the summertime, at least at that point, uh, we sailed off across the Long Island Sound. He had a nephew with him and an intern from Yale who, uh, who did everything else on the boat. We sailed across the Sound and dropped anchor and uh, ate dinner. It was such a, a lovely time. And it was about 10 o'clock at night, I had great conversation. And he said, well, it's time for a swim. I said, well, okay. So I was up on the the bow of the boat, looking through my gym bag for my swim trunks, and, and saw Bill Buckley out of the corner of my eye dive off the transom. Swimsuit optional. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so I thought, uh, well, when in Rome, and uh, it was a, a memorable time. I've, I've, I've not related that story. I thought I'd have to wait until he passed. But uh, I thought I'd uh, write a column at some point titled, Buck naked with Bill Buckley, but, uh, but I've not yet done so. So I hope nobody tweets anything out. But I still remember sailing back the next day. It was an easy sail, just uh, didn't have to tack either way. And, and so he said, all of a sudden, it's time for a word game. I thought, oh, no, this could be really embarrassing. I mean, it's like playing, you know, one-on-one -on -one with Michael Jordan or something like this, and we were playing a game called Ghost, which was new to me, but uh, where you, you say a letter and the next person has to say another letter and continue on spelling a legitimate word. And if you believe that uh, somebody's making up a word, you can challenge them. So I started uh, one of the rounds with an S. He followed with an F. I thought, is there a legitimate word that starts with S-F. So I did something I never should have done. I challenged Bill Buckley. <laughs> and uh, he said, uh, well, the word is sfumato. You can look it up. And I did when I got home, and he was right. <laughs> but, uh, but I was getting knocked out by the intern and everybody else. But uh, it, was, it was just a, a wonderful experience, and I've always admired uh, Bill Buckley. A few years later, when I decided to, to run for Congress, I got in the mail a letter from Bill Buckley, which had contained a $250 check. Uh, and uh, of all the campaign contributions I received uh, in uh, 18 years, that $250 check uh, was the one I valued the very most. So uh, thank you again for inviting me here, allowing me to be here um, to, to give this talk. I grew up in a small town, as I mentioned, on a dry dusty ranch in Snowflake, Arizona. Snowflake was settled. You might think, how could a town in, Snow, or in Arizona be named Snowflake? Uh, it was actually named because of my great-great-grandfather, William Jordan Flake, and Erastus Snow, uh, two Mormon settlers who had been sent to Arizona by Brigham Young to settle the, the territory. Um, and so I grew up uh, with 10 brothers and sisters, 69 first cousins on my father's side alone. That's how I got elected, by the way. <laughs> but I, I grew up not knowing that Flake was a pejorative fun, uh, name because nobody made fun of us there. But, uh, but I grew up respecting those involved in public service. Uh, my father uh, did his turn as mayor of Snowflake. It became, by the time I was there, a town of about 5,000. Uh, my uncle, Jake Flake, from Snowflake, um, real name, real place. Jake was the Speaker of the House in Arizona for a time. He passed away about 10 years ago after being thrown from his horse, uh, the, the last of the true Arizona cowboys, uh, the cowboy legislators. But it was a great place to grow up, and one element of growing up in Snowflake is uh, you, you didn't worry too much about who was a 
Democrat and who was a Republican. It was a small town. When things had to be done, things got done. Uh, famously, the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or the Mormon Church, was concerned that too many members would be affiliated with one party over another, and it might uh, put the church in a bad position if the administration changed. So uh, in the late 1800s, the church would sometimes go around to churches, and, and the leadership would say, those sitting in the left pews will register Democrat, those sitting in the right register Republican. In, in Snowflake, it was those living east of Main Street will be Democrats, those west of Main Street, Republicans. The Flakes were living east of Main Street. And so my father and his brothers and their father and their father before uh, were Democrats. And it was uh, just a matter of course, but didn't mean much philosophically. When my mother met my father and after talking to him a while, she said, Dean, I think you're more of a Republican. He said, okay, and he switched, <laughs> and, 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 that, and that has held. But uh, I'll talk a little more about uh, partisanship in a minute. But um, after growing up in Snowflake, I went away to college, um, but first uh, served a, a Mormon mission in the country of South Africa and Zimbabwe, fell in love with Africa politics, and fell in love with the region. And then when I got back to school, I decided to study it. Uh, more heavily. But when I did get back home, the first thing I did was, was go off to Hawaii. BYU has a campus on the North Shore. It's one of the best secrets out there. Um, I got there the first day of school, threw my things as any good Arizona boy would do, and ran to the beach and met a pretty girl sunning herself uh, on the beach there. And I introduced myself as Jeff Flake. She laughed at my last name. And now I got the last laugh. This is uh, Cheryl Flake here in the audience. We've been married now for 33 years. But uh, seven years after we got married, we went back to that spot where we met on the beach, left the kids at home, and, and reminisced about our time there. I feel a little chagrin telling this story here at Yale, or an institution of real higher learning. But uh, after we went and reminisced on that spot on the beach, we drove up to the school. I said to Cheryl, this has changed. This is, that's a new building there on the right. She said, no, that's the library. <laughs> she said, that was here when we were. <laughs> but it was new to me. <laughs> that says more about my uh, early college years than I perhaps want to admit. Uh, but later on, we went to Provo, Utah, and got a little more serious about school. And I got a degree in international relations and another in political science and we went to Washington to do an internship and, uh, and, and really wanted to, to study Africa politics. Got an opportunity uh, two years later to go back to the country, well, back to Southern Africa and to the country of Namibia. Namibia at that time, 1989-90, was uh, gaining its independence from South Africa. To be in a country that has its first elections and writes its constitution, uh, that's... Uh, pretty much nirvana for a political junkie. And it was a wonderful time. Uh, some of the things I remember so well is that that week of Namibia's elections in November of 1989 is a, the week that the Berlin Wall came down. And Namibia had that good fortune of becoming independent uh, just as the Soviet empire collapsed. And that Soviet socialist model was discredited and gone. It was a wonderful time. The Soviet uh, Union was shedding republics by the day and freedom was squinting out everywhere. And what I really remember about that time was uh, in February of 1990, the next year, I picked up a Time magazine, not much internet at that time, uh, but saw that Vaclav Havel, the new president of then Czechoslovakia, had delivered a speech before the United States Congress where he poured out his gratitude uh, for the example of the United States, for our moral leadership, for helping to liberate his country once again, and for establishing an international order based on liberal democracy and free trade. It was really a, 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 a love letter to the United States and talked about the indispensable nature of United States leadership around the, world, around the globe. 
that, that feeling of the indispensable role of the U.S. has, has never left me. And it really motivated me to, to go into public service. And we want to talk today for a, a little bit about polarizing partisanship and to determine whether or not that is the uh, new order, the new normal. Maybe a subtext or a subheadline would be are the better angels of our nature on permanent furlough? It seemed sometimes uh, that they are. The question is, is it any worse today than it has ever been? Or is that just us every year thinking it's uh, the worst that it's been? Um, let's step back for a bit and, and figure out how we've come to this place that we are. Uh, looking at the institution of Congress, it used to be that when members of Congress were elected from their home state, they would move their families to Washington. I uh, read the autobiography a while ago of uh, Mo Udall, a longtime serving Democrat from Arizona, later ran for president. In the 1960s, he wrote a book called The Job of a Congressman. And in it, uh, I read, he said, that our office budget in Washington is large enough that we can travel home to Arizona three times a year. So the rest of that time, they were in Washington. And the children of Republican congressmen would go to school and play on sports teams with the children of Democratic congressmen and senators. And the bonds of friendship that the, the families had during those times usually overwhelmed the partisanship uh, that happened during the weekdays. Uh, they learn to trust each other. There's an old saying in Washington that you'll never question your colleague's motives if you know the names of his or her children. And there is a lot of truth to that. And that's something we have, we have certainly lost. We've been headed in this uh, direction for quite a while. I should say that the advent of uh, jet travel and the decreasing expense and the ease of it really hastened uh, what we now have is a commuter congress. But in the 1990s, Newt Gingrich uh, famously told the freshman Republicans, keep your families at home, don't move uh, to Washington, you'll need to be campaigning. And that really accelerated this trend that was already happening. So by the time I got to Washington, uh, we had a commuter congress where you come in on a Monday night or a Tuesday night and you're, you're home in your home state or district uh, by Thursday night and you just don't have those bonds of friendship developed across the aisle that you used to have. Of course, that's, that's not the only uh, problem that we've had, and we'll talk about some of those. But, uh, but I can say that over my 18 years in Congress, things have changed quite dramatically. I remember during my first year in Congress, uh, I latched onto an issue that I thought was important for Republicans. Uh, not many people cared about it, but I always thought uh, that Americans ought to be able to travel wherever they want to. There's a freedom issue for me. Any country, as long as there was no compelling national security reason why they couldn't. And it always puzzled me as to why Republic or nobody was allowed to travel to Cuba. Uh, Republicans had preached the gospel of engagement and travel and commerce. Uh, you know, with every other country, but with Cuba, we said, well, let's isolate it. It'll It'll change, uh, and we can nudge it toward democracy in another way. Well, 50 years in, it hadn't changed <laughs> that much. So I thought, you know, if we want to punish the Castro brothers, we ought to make them deal with spring break just once or twice. You know, <laughs> That would serve them right. They'd probably wave the white flag and say, yeah, that's enough. Uh, but, uh, but so I, I worked to pass legislation to, to lift the travel ban, or at least... The only way I could get legislation to the floor, because my Republican leadership opposed it, was to propose a, an amendment that would prohibit funding for the enforcement of the travel ban, which would, in fact, get rid of it. And I, I remember debating that uh, piece of legislation for the first time on the floor, and one of my Republican colleagues, um, a Cuban-American who didn't like what I was proposing, he thought we should continue to isolate, he stood up and he said, the gentleman from, Cal from Arizona just wants to lift the travel ban so he can drink mojitos on the beach in Cuba. As soon as he said that, uh, David Obie, a long-serving Democrat from the state of Wisconsin, 
former chairman of the Appropriations Committee, stood and demanded that those words be stricken from the record. When they do that, they have to stop and read back through the record, slander you once again, you know, and see if it rises to the level of defamation, and, and they, you know, consult on it for a while with a parliamentarian, and anyway, they stopped and struck it from the record, and we went on, and I, I passed the amendment. Uh, I went over to David Opie, and I said, you really don't know me. Uh, why did you do that? I, I had not seen then, and have hardly seen since, a, a Democrat protecting a Republican, a Republican protecting a Democrat like that. And he said, very gruffly, he said, ah, Flake, I know you're Mormon. He said, I know you don't drink. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I, I was just protecting your honor. <laughs> I appreciated that. It was a, a kind gesture, and uh, those gestures were far more common in the old days uh, than they have been in recent history. To talk about where we have come to, uh, you'll all remember uh, the, the shooting of Gabby Giffords in Arizona. Uh, my colleague who was holding a constituent event in Tucson in a supermarket parking lot, and uh, she was gravely wounded. Uh, several others were killed. She, uh, this was right before the State of the Union Address, I believe in 2011. And uh, so we left a seat, an empty seat, among the Arizona delegation. We all sat together in her honor. And a year later, she had recovered enough to come to Congress, but just to resign. And so she was there at the next State of the Union Address. And uh, I, as her friend, sat next to her. And as President Obama delivered his State of the Union Address, she was intent on standing uh, during the applause lines uh, for, for the Democrats. And so I helped her up, which left me, the lone Republican, standing <laughs> in a sea of Democrats. I immediately started getting calls and texts and emails uh, chastising me for agreeing with President Obama. Why was I doing this? Why was I consorting with the enemy? Uh, such as the a state of a shattered politics, I would argue. Something similar happened uh, when Tim Kaine was announced as Hillary Clinton's running mate. I, uh, Tim and I had worked together on an AUMF, or Authorization for Use of Military Force, trying to rein in, at that point, a Democratic president to make sure that Congress assumed its rightful role in terms of war powers. Uh, so I, I knew Tim well, I knew his son, Nat was a, a Marine. Uh, Tim and I didn't agree much philosophically, but I knew him to be a patriotic senator and a good member. So I playfully tweeted that time, now I have to count the ways I hate Tim Kaine. I said, but I'm drawing a blank. He's a good man and a good friend. Congratulations. Immediately, again, texts and calls and emails. What are you doing? Why would you say that about somebody? who was a Democrat. I was at an event a few days later in Arizona, a Republican event, where somebody stood and chastised me right uh, on the spot. And he said, if you can't say anything bad, don't. And he stopped right there. And he almost reversed every piece of advice his mother ever gave him. <laughs> but I thought at that time again, what have we come to? Uh, why are we here? Uh, we've got to do better. Just about a year and a half ago, or coming up on two years ago, I was in June of uh, 2016. I was, uh, or 2017, I was on the baseball field where Republicans were practicing for one of the best bipartisan institutions still left in Congress, the Congressional Baseball Game. I was standing somewhere between home plate and first base and heard a shot ring out, and I looked to my left at uh, Joe Barton from Texas, and we were trying to figure out uh, what was that. Surely a gunshot, but where did it come from? A few seconds later, there was a volley, and our third baseman yelled, shooter, shooter. And then Steve Scalise went down at second base. And I just remember, it seems, a stalled moment in time. I turned and looked to the dugout, about the only place I could think to run. And uh, 
looked and watched as bullets pitched off the gravel in front of me. Uh, but I just remember thinking at that time, why us? How could anyone look at a bunch of middle-aged men playing baseball, bad baseball, and see the enemy? How could that be? Uh, the next eight to ten minutes were a bit of a blur. We, I went in the dugout, as did several of my colleagues. Uh, one came in, had been shot in the leg, one of the, the staff members. We were put a tourniquet using somebody's belt on his leg, and then uh, while, while bullets uh, whizzed overhead in the dugout. And when we finally heard somebody yell, the shooter down, I ran out to Steve Scalise and used my batting glove to plug the hole in his hip, and then used his phone to call his wife to tell him that he'd been shot so she wouldn't have to hear it on the news. But I thought at that time again, where have we come to when people are this riled up? The shooter in his pocket, uh, he had a list of Republican members that he wasn't pleased with. He had uh, earlier that day stopped by the practice and asked if this was a, was a Republican practice. We've got to do better. Why is it so difficult uh, for members to react on a bipartisan level and to come to the middle at times. We work in a legislative body, the U.S. Congress, but sometimes we don't acknowledge that and think that we can do it all on our own. I can tell you that all the incentives these days are to, to push people both left and right to the extremes. Uh, whenever there's a big issue that comes up, a big issue like debt, deficit, or guns, or climate change, or Kavanaugh, or you name it, the incentives are to race to your tribe, to seek the safety that's there, and never indicate for a moment that you might be open to persuasion, or that a hearing that you might be chairing might somehow inform your vote, or that an investigation that might be going on might be dispositive, or it might influence you, because as soon as you do, then both sides are after you, and nobody wants that. Uh, I've lived in that space for the past two years, and it's an uncomfortable place to be. We've got to change the incentives. People figure and make a calculation, members of the Congress, that they only want to anger one side and not both. And if you rush fast enough and declare where you are, you won't even anger one side because they'll figure you were never gettable. And so that's what we've seen, and that's why you see on any big issue a diminishing number of people who are actually deliberating in the most deliberative body in the world, or what is supposed to be. So what can we do? It's, it's not a comfortable place, like I say, to be the man in the middle. Time Magazine, their picture of the year was a picture during the Kavanaugh hearing of all my colleagues standing around with, with me in the middle, uh, trying to decide who was going where or what was going to happen. Uh, they titled that, uh, The Man in the Middle. But uh, what is our responsibility as, uh, as elected officials? And what is the responsibility of others? I think as elected officials, and it's difficult to respond to every, uh, every act of incivility that's out there. You certainly can't. Uh, but when things are said that really are the antithesis of what we believe or go so much against our norms or principles, uh, then we ought to speak out. I've been critical over the past couple of years of the president in many instances when he has used uh, a vulgarity or crude words to respond or to, to, to label or talk about some of my colleagues. And so when a, a Democrat the other day used very crude and vulgar language to talk about the president and whether he should be impeached or not, I thought it was my responsibility to tweet something out, which I did. I said, uh, language like this has no place in politics. Just because the president might speak this way should not give the rest of us license to do so. Immediately, people started commenting. Within two days, there were 30,000 comments on that tweet. The vast majority of them were saying, 
if the president speaks this way, then so must we. Uh, that is a problem today with politics, where one side ups the ante and the other responds, and I would suggest uh, that that's uh, the wrong way to go. When I got to the Senate, uh, I was so chagrined by the lack of, of bipartisanship or the failure of people to get together that I decided to take an extreme measure to uh, prove that Republicans and Democrats can get along. Uh, I should back up about uh, 10 years before, or long before that, I mentioned I grew up on a dry, dusty ranch. I always loved to read sailing adventures. I mentioned I'd read a lot of Buckley's stories. And uh, you know, I guess that's what you get when you grow up in a dusty, dry place. But I, I loved to read especially uh, sailing adventures gone bad. That was my favorite genre. <laughs> and I always wondered if I were marooned on a deserted island, could I survive on my own? I talked about this so much that my wife got so tired of it. Finally, 10 years ago, she said, if this is your midlife crisis, would you get it over with? <laughs> would you maroon yourself somewhere? And so I did. <laughs> I, I picked an island on Google Earth, about halfway between Hawaii and Australia, in the Marshall Islands. I uh, got permission from their government to, uh, to be a, a castaway. Uh, flew to Hawaii, then to Majuro, then to Kwanjalein, and then had a fishing boat take me to a little island, about 10 acres big, never occupied, and drop me off for a week with no food or water. <laughs> Just a desalinator pump and a few tools, and uh, it was a spectacular time. I loved it. I made it. <laughs> it's a great diet, in case you're asking. <laughs> you better like coconut, <laughs> because uh, that's a big part of the diet. But, uh, but it was a spectacular thing. Um, a few years later, after a tough Senate race, I told our two youngest kids at home who hadn't seen much of me during the campaign, if we get through this campaign, I'll take you back to the island. And so I did, and we had much the same experience. At least I had somebody to pump my water for me. <laughs> but uh, no phones, no distractions, no electronics. It was just a lot of sharks, but it was, uh, it was a wonderful experience. So I was sitting on the Senate, uh, in the Senate chamber one night, and Martin Heinrich, a Democrat from New Mexico, who had been elected the same time that I was, uh, just uh, the year before, uh, we had served together in the House for a while, and I knew him. He was a real outdoorsman. Uh, he had heard of my adventure with my boys, and he said, hey, that sounds fun, and he started showing me pictures of the fish that he had speared in Hawaii. I thought, this guy could be useful. <laughs> but, uh, but so Martin and I cooked up a plan that we wouldn't tell any of our colleagues, but that we would uh, head off back to those islands and prove that Republicans and Democrats can get along. So we thought, well, there are a lot of survivor shows on television. Maybe somebody would be interested if we brought back some footage. Uh, and uh, so I went to Discovery Channel and said, hey, well, we we're going to take a GoPro uh, and, uh, and film our experience. Uh, would you want any of the footage afterwards? They said, no, we want to come film. I said, this is not naked and afraid. <laughs> but, uh, afraid, yes, but, uh, but not the first part. So uh, we put that in the contract that uh, we'd be clothed. And uh, Discovery Channel came and filmed us for a week in the Marshall Islands with basically just a machete between us. <laughs> No food, no water, just a machete and a few implements to try to, to spear fish. And it was an incredible time, a tough time. Uh, some of the things we had to do were not very senatorial. Climbing through the jungle interior of the island to find little sips of water left on palm fronds. Uh, but we made it. We survived. And we came back and uh, went on the Senate floor and Word leaked out that we'd been, during the break, by the way, uh, to this island, and uh, not one of our colleagues had known that we had gone. And it was uh, quite an interesting experience. I still remember Bernie Sanders walking up, just shaking his head. You know, these coconuts, he kept saying, coconuts, what are you? <laughs> how do you <laughs> trying, to, trying to figure out how we'd survive that experience. But uh, then we went on and did all the, the late night shows, and. Uh, and the others, and talked about this experience. And uh, Stephen Colbert memorably played a clip of us spearing fish and eating raw clam and 
said, Flake and Heinrich have done us all a service. They have proved that Republicans and Democrats can get along if death is the only option. <laughs> so, for what it's worth, uh, we've proven it. I, I hope that we don't have to take such extreme measures. I'd hate to see you know, Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer with just a machete between them uh, on an island. I'm not sure that it would end well. But, uh, or maybe it would. Who knows? Um, but there are uh, some good signs out there every once in a while that civility will return. There used to be in the Senate uh, a procedure or something that would happen uh, that uh, it was called pairing votes. When a, a Democrat had to be away from Washington at, uh, for a family emergency, emergency or a death in the family, and if there was a vote on the floor that, uh, that it wouldn't have been close enough to change the outcome, but uh, you would have a Republican or vice versa uh, switch his vote in order to, as a gesture to his colleague. Uh, so it wouldn't change the outcome and, uh, and it, would, uh, it was just a kind gesture. That used to happen quite frequently. It hasn't happened really in years. Until just the other day, when we were voting in the Foreign Relations Committee, well, about a year ago, um, Mike Pompeo's nomination, it was a very close vote, a party line vote for the most part, in the Foreign Relations Committee. The uh, problem was one of our members on the Republican side, Johnny Isaacson, who was in pretty frail health himself at the time, was delivering the eulogy at his best friend's funeral away in Georgia and couldn't be there that day for the vote. And the question was, would we have to postpone the vote until the middle of the night? We had to get it done that day and force Johnny to get on a plane and come back to Washington in the middle of the night until Chris Coons, the Democrat on the committee, stepped forward and said that he would pair his vote uh, with Johnny's and vote no until Johnny could come back. I just remember Bob Corker, the Republican chairman of the committee, openly crying uh, t because he hadn't seen that kind of gesture in a long, long time. There are good signs out there that the parties can come together on big issues. I think criminal justice reform that just happened in December of this year is one. We're on a fairly big issue, uh, which Republicans and Democrats had worked on, some of us, for years. Uh, we actually found the sweet spot where we could agree and pass that legislation on a very bipartisan basis, I think that augurs well for the future. I do believe that if we can have leadership uh, from among people in Congress, and certainly would help from the White House, if we had leadership that would look at this divide that we have and seek to heal it rather than take advantage of it to further divide us, then we can make some progress, then we could do some good. Before taking questions, uh, let me just say how much uh, I appreciate being here and how much, uh, what an honor it has been to represent Arizona in the Senate for uh, the last six years and in the House for 12 before. And I'm often asked, uh, what was the most memorable experience you had in Congress? And one always springs to mind, and I'll, I'll tell you about it. I mentioned that uh, I've been trying for years to change our policy toward Cuba to allow Americans to travel there. I was able to pass that legislation I mentioned a couple of times in the House in the early years. I couldn't get President Bush to sign it. Uh, and then by the time President Obama came along, who would have signed it, I couldn't pass it anymore. <laughs> and uh, so, but President Obama did make some changes, allowing Cuban Americans to travel as frequently as they wanted and remit as much money, which allowed their family members to gain some independence from that communist government there. But we couldn't uh, have diplomatic relations or make any further progress as long as Cuba continued to hold and imprison an American that they had, that they had jailed. His name was Alan Gross. Uh, he was a USAID contractor who was working to get better information to the Jewish community in Havana. Uh, the Cubans uh, who punch above their weight in security <laughs> <laughs> and uh, intelligence, uh, I learned well from the, from the Russians, 
uh, they had been watching him the whole time and uh, caught him, tried him, convicted him, and jailed him, sentenced a 60-year-old man to 20-some years. He had spent uh, five years in prison. Uh, we had been trying to secure his release. And in November of 2014, Tom Udall and I had been down to uh, Havana to visit him in prison. He was ready to, to take himself out, he said. Uh, he said, I won't spend another birthday in prison. His health was failing. He'd lost over 100 pounds. And I remember him looking up at the glass uh, uh, over the cell where the Cuban government obviously watches and listens to what he said. He said, you hear that? I'll take myself out. So he was serious about it. So Tom and I got home, went to the White House and said, I hope you're negotiating for his release because he won't last long. They have been. And I got a call along with Pat Leahy, who I'd been working with on this issue, and said, ask if I would undertake a sensitive mission but I couldn't tell my wife or my staff where I was going uh, just two days from then. This was a Monday, and on Wednesday, December 14th of 2014, uh, I needed to be at Andrews Air Force Base at 5 a.m. So Pat Leahy and I made our way there at 5 a.m., climbed on one of the president's planes, and there was Judy Gross, Alan's wife, who we'd been working with to try to secure his release. We took off, and immediately after we took off, another plane took off uh, from Andrews. It was to pick up a Cuban national who had spied for us for years before being caught and uh, spending 20 years in a Cuban prison. Another plane took off from Miami about an hour later with three Cubans who had been in our jails convicted as spies. So it was an old Cold War era prisoner or spy swap. And uh, we landed in Havana, all three planes, at the same time at different airfields. Uh, Pat and I got off the plane, went into a room, and watched as Alan Gross was reunited with his wife. Uh, we went into another room and met with the Cuban foreign minister for a few minutes, and then went out to the tarmac and waited for the signal when all three planes would take off again. The, the plane picking up the Cuban national was to fly to parts unknown. Uh, but we were to fly back to Washington. And uh, we got the signal, and exactly 31 minutes after we landed, we took off again. And the moment that, that will forever stick with me is a half hour into our flight, uh, the pilot came on and said, we have now entered U.S. airspace. And Alan Gross stood up and shook his fists in the air and cheered and then just breathed in and out several times and uh, said, now I know I'm free. And it was a moment that I will never forget, and it reminded me again of, of the special role that the United States plays around the world and how people, as Vaclav Havel had said so many years before, people who long to be free are, have been aided uh, by the United States. I'm grateful for this country that we have. I'm grateful for this system that, of government that we have. It is one that tends to, to uh, right itself, if you will. It is a good system of government. There are good people in Washington. There are things that we can do as citizens uh, to make sure that bipartisanship happens. It is a necessary thing in Washington and that we can eschew this partisanship, this debilitating partisanship that has enveloped this country uh, in the future. So thank you for having me here. I appreciate the honor. We have time for questions, so if you just raise your hand, we'll pass you a mic. Senator, uh, for coming out. Um, now that you are outside of public office, perhaps you have a, a, a perspective on this. What can 
for lack of a better word, civilians like yourself now, uh, do to change this this partisan atmosphere aside from avoiding abuse of moderates on Twitter. So. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, I'll tell a little about what I'm, I'm doing and what I think that we all can do. Um, I'm doing some work with uh, CBS News right now on a new series called uh, Common Ground. Uh, Common Ground may be dead in Washington right now or, or on leave from Washington, but it's, uh, it's alive and well everywhere else where local governments have to reach agreement. They can't you know, continue to run deficits or pass continuing resolutions. They actually have to solve problems. And uh, so we're going to tell some of those stories. Uh, the first one will air um, on Wednesday of this next week, and we'll do one every five weeks or so after that. But I think what all of us can do, I think the situation and the incentives that I talked about will change when voters again value and show that value as they vote of people who could actually govern and who have demonstrated the ability or expressed the willingness uh, to reach across the aisle when they need to. I'm, I'm a conservative Republican. Um, I, I have principles that I want to stick to and try to, but, uh, but you have to understand in a legislative body that sometimes, uh, as Barry Goldwater once said, he's known for talking about uh, standing on principle, but he also said, politics is nothing more than public business. Sometimes you make the best of a mixed bargain. <laughs> and and uh, that seems to be forgotten now. And if we want conservative outcomes uh, as a conservative, uh, you, you've got to do that by finding some type of uh, accommodation with those around you. Other than that, it's very rare that one party will have 60 votes in the Senate and uh, a majority in the House and also the White House. And if they do, they typically will pass legislation that doesn't endure. The next party will come in and try to undo it. And uh, you seesaw back and forth rather than saying, let's, uh, let's move slowly like the Senate is designed to do, uh, but find a combination on some of these things. And, uh, and I think as, as soon as the voters value that and politicians sense that, then behavior will change. But right now, like I said, the comfort is, the comfort zone for politicians is to rush to the extreme. And as much as we've seen that on the Republican side, it's sure, certainly evident on the Democratic side as well, to fight fire with fire. Um, and then we have a situation where it just spirals out of control. And uh, you have not just uh, debilitating partisanship, but things as serious as death threats for members who uh, express a preference here or there. And that's something that, uh, that we've all experienced in the past year. So one of the problems I think that we have with partisanship is that people in elected office are more concerned about primaries than they are about the general election. And would you comment on how gerrymandered districts can contribute to that? Oh, certainly, it's been a, something I haven't had to worry about, obviously, for the past six years in the Senate. But it is a big problem. Uh, when you look around the country and see how few districts uh, in a big state like California uh, are actually really competitive, uh, we've, that, that's, uh, that's been a huge problem as long as uh, state legislatures uh, control that process it's going to be a political outcome. But I can also tell you that Arizona, we have a, a fair districting commission, and uh, that hasn't taken politics out of the process either. Uh, so, uh, but, but it is an issue. The courts continue to intervene, and uh, uh, Voting Rights Act still governs a lot of what can and, and cannot be done. Uh, but we've got to find a way to, to make these, uh, these districts more competitive. Like I said, it's, it's complicated particularly with the Voting Rights Act in so many areas. Uh, but that does contribute to the problem. And we have a situation in Arizona, uh, as a Republican, um, you have to move so far right to be competitive in a statewide primary uh, that uh, puts you in a bad place in Arizona, in particular, with a very late primary in late August to turn around, you know, just six weeks later when early voting starts to recover 
in a general election. And uh, so it's, it's, uh, it, it's a challenge, and, and that, that is felt all over the country. So, so few congressional districts are truly competitive. And uh, I, I don't know the overall solution. Some, of the, some states have done better than others at actually having a fair process uh, for reallocating these districts. But it is typically a political process and yields political ends. Hi. Um, you have obviously been a critic of the president in the past, um, and in the last few weeks, rather months, we've been hearing more and more people come out to say um, that they're going to be running uh, for the Democrats for uh, the next presidential campaign. Um, I'm wondering whether you think um, the Conservative Party ought to run uh, someone to represent, um, I guess, the stance that, that you represent as as a conservative Republican who's been sticking with your principles? Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> we got one voter out there, at least. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> I, uh, you know, is there any Democrat that's not running at this point? I think we're up to 20 today. It'll be more tomorrow. It'll be uh, nice to see that on that side, but I frankly wish we had more uh, competition on our side. I've, I've said uh, all along, I do hope that another Republican runs if for no other reason to remind Republicans uh, what, conservative principle, uh, what conservative principles have really animated the party for the past generation or two, and I think we'll need to get back to if we're going to be a major force in the future. Um, it's, it's tough to see success down that road. I think if the president uh, wants to be renominated, he will be. Those polls that show that he has 80 to 90 percent support among Republican primary voters are probably pretty accurate. Uh, but I do, do think that there's value in at least uh, uh, reminding Republicans that there is life after. Um, because I, I, I just don't think that we can be a major force as Republicans long in the future if we continue with some of the policies and, and certainly some of the tone and tenor uh, that we currently see in the party. So as far as whether it's a, from the conservative party or or uh, somebody else, I know that uh, Howard Schultz is talking about running as a, an independent. Democrats are mortified by that prospect of vote splitting. Uh, we'll see where that goes, but, uh, but I do hope that there is another Republican who will step forward. Uh, some are still toying with the idea. And, uh, and I, I, I do hope that uh, the president, if he is going to be the only one on the ballot, will, will pivot in some way, but I've I'm not too confident of that. <laughs> to follow up on that, set aside personality and tone. Where do conservatism and populism intersect? Um, conservatism and populism intersect. <laughs> Uh, I, I do think that this country is still a, a center-right country. I think that's where the voters typically are. And, and so I guess you would say that the traditional uh, values and principles the Republican Party has espoused, limited government, uh, we haven't heard anything uh, recently from the Republican Party about reigning in our deficit or dealing with our debt. Uh, free trade, uh, we've always been the party that has valued free trade and has stood against uh, tariffs and those kind of taxes. Uh, strong American leadership abroad. Uh, we are the architects of this international order based on liberal democracies and free markets and free trade, and we seem to be going away with it, I, from it. I think that those are still popular, if not populist, <laughs> ideas. But we have to recognize as well um, one area where I think Republicans will need to and have to improve on is with, with trade in general. I think we have, uh, we have these, these institutions that we have, uh, as I said, been the architect of that are supposed to manage trade and make sure that all parties play fair. Uh, China has not 
played fair. And we have not done a good enough job of holding their feet to the fire. Uh, that is something that the president pledged to do, and I think that that is something that uh, uh, was an idea that, that gained him a lot of votes. Now, I happen to think that we're going to have a very difficult time doing that if we insult our allies or impose tariffs on our allies and then expect them to be with us as we challenge China, because China will simply go in the back door and take advantage of that void uh, that is left. Uh, but that's something that uh, where I think that that's conservative policy and it intersects with populism. But I, I, I do think that, uh, like I said, if we can articulate well and do it as happy warriors, as, uh, as people who are, are inspirational and aspirational, as uh, some of our leaders have shown in the past, that we'll do fine moving ahead. There's this, what I think is a false narrative that has been played out that, that Donald Trump is the only person that could have won the last election. Uh, the only one that we could have nominated who would have beat Hillary Clinton. I, I don't believe that's the case at all. Uh, I, I believe that uh, we, can, we can stay with traditional conservative principles and do fine. Uh, would you comment on two of your signature issues, immigration and fiscal responsibility, please? Well, the, the last one first, fiscal responsibility. Um, I'm very concerned about uh, where we are there. We've, as a country, have blown by every threshold that trip up just about every other country in terms of our debt to GDP ratio. And uh, because we've been able to do that uh, blithely for so long, uh, people have just kind of dismissed that as an issue. But with a, a deficit, uh, again, of a trillion dollars, adding to a debt of $23 trillion, at some point, uh, people just aren't going to buy our debt anymore. And I think that to move beyond that, when we go over that cliff, it's very difficult uh, to, uh, to struggle back because we don't have any tools anymore to do so. You monetary policy, you're pretty much stuck. And uh, that, that worries me greatly. Democrats haven't been concerned about this issue for a while. Republicans used to be, and we seem to have forgotten it. The irony is the only one really mentioning it is Howard Schultz, the independent candidate. Uh, but it's, it's something that I, I think that, uh, that we need to be as responsible uh, uh, citizens concerned about. With immigration, I've long felt, and I'm from Arizona, we're a border state, but I've long favored comprehensive immigration reform that includes stronger border security. We do have a crisis on our southern border right now. We do have to deal uh, particularly with those coming to seek asylum. It's a much different crisis than we've faced before. We don't have uh, you know, people coming in droves to come work uh, from Mexico like they used to. We still have net migration south by Mexican citizens, but those coming from Guatemala and El Salvador and Honduras, uh, that is a real crisis right now that we need to deal with. Uh, it's not as simple as simply building a barrier. 90% uh, of those who are coming um, are going right to our ports of entry and presenting themselves uh, as asylees. Uh, we need to work with those host countries, in my view, um, require those seeking asylum to register in their home countries, not as they come to the southern border. And, but that can only be done by working closely with those host countries in a comprehensive manner. Uh, I do think that with Republic, as, as Republicans, this is an issue when you look uh, demographically. If we want to be a meaningful party in the future, uh, we've got to find a different place than we are right now on immigration or how people perceive our party because of the president's tone and his rhetoric. And uh, I think you can just look at California and what California has experienced over the past 25 years. If you remember the mid-90s when Pete Wilson, a Republican governor, when they used to elect, elect public Republican governors in California and Republican senators and other statewide office holders, he wanted a second term. Nobody was very excited about it. 
and he latched on to Prop 187, uh, which uh, the rhetoric for which uh, sounds a lot like the rhetoric that the Republican Party or the White House at least is employing today on the immigration issue. They did succeed, the Republican Party in California in the mid-90s, the rally in the vote, getting people out there. Pete Wilson won a second term. But in the meantime, it turned off immigrants and minorities and suburban women and others to a point where the only Republican elected since in California has been Arnold Schwarzenegger and who later changed party and then won insurance commissioner for four years. For 25 years, virtually no Republican statewide office holders and we may not see them there for another generation. I don't want uh, the party as a whole to suffer the same fate that the California Republican Party has faced. And I think unless we find a better place to be on immigration, uh, then, then we're going to suffer that fate. Good evening, sir. Thank you for coming here again. Uh, I was just wondering if you could uh, elaborate more on your experience working with and serving alongside the late Senator John McCain. And uh, as a man of many great principles, I was just wondering if he influenced the way you envision a future of bipartisanship and how it has affected your political stances whatsoever. Sure. Well, it was, it was a, a great honor to serve alongside John McCain. I uh, was so uh, fortunate to get to know Barry Goldwater uh, in the, the last years he was here and then to serve with, with John McCain during the, my 12 years in the House and six in the Senate. One of the most memorable times I remember is um, early in the House, I was uh, going after these spending items called earmarks that uh, uh, completely corrupted our process of spending. A couple of my colleagues were in jail for uh, uh, improprieties related to earmarks. It was, it was, it was about uh, $60 billion uh, over 60,000 earmarks, I'm sorry, 30,000 earmarks in one year. It had just become a process out of control. Uh, but uh, earmarks had become quite popular at home. The mayors and, uh, and other elected officials locally had come to think that that's the only way they could get funding out of Washington, so they would press their members to get these earmarks. And so me taking a stand against them angered a lot of people at home, and I was getting beat up unmercifully. <laughs> Um, when I got home by these elected officials and by the, the main paper, the Arizona Republic and others. And I remember flying home to Arizona uh, at the height of this and uh, John McCain uh, worked his way back to where I was sitting on the plane and stuck his finger in my chest and I thought, oh no, him too. <laughs> and, uh, and he said, don't back down. <laughs> he said, you're in the right, they'll come around. And uh, that was all I needed. And um, they did come around. Uh, a few years later, we banished earmarks for good. Uh, both parties realized it was corrupting the process. And uh, I, I just remember uh, being at his uh, bedside the day before he died and being with the, the family and, and, and talking about uh, uh, the experiences that he'd had in Arizona and uh, a few months before sitting him with him at his ranch there and, and talking about all the, the personalities and figures that had gone through Arizona that he knew. And, uh, and it was, it was a, a great experience. John McCain could be irascible and tough. Uh, the first vote that I cast in the Senate, he came up and just gave it to me. <laughs> he didn't agree with the way I had voted. Uh, but the next day, and all my colleagues were standing around laughing and thinking that he's got the initiation. But the next day, he'd come and uh, apologized and said, let's work together, and, and that's how he was. Uh, and he did that with both sides of the aisle, and that's why uh, at his funeral and during the week of his passing, you saw adoration from all sides. And I think that uh, that's, that's more of the model that we need to have if we're going to be a relevant party in the future. Hi, uh, thank you for being with us tonight. Um, 
So calls for broad institutional changes have been especially salient in uh, political discourse these days. And I wanted to ask you to comment on two of those uh, controversial pr proposals. First uh, is uh, reforming or abolishing the Senate filibuster. And the second is moving away from the Electoral College to a national pop popular vote when electing the president. Thank okay. you. All right. Um, on the first one, getting away from the filibuster, we've, we've moved away from the filibuster with regard to the president's executive calendar nominees, which I don't think is a good move. But uh, in reality, prior to 2003, nobody ever filibustered any of the president's executive calendar. You just didn't do it. Uh, as controversial as Clarence Thomas was or uh, Judge Bork, not one senator ever required 60 votes or forced a cloture vote. You just didn't do it. And so basically we are de jure what was de facto prior to 2003. So we're about in the same place other than that process is totally politicized but in terms of the rules. But getting rid of the uh, legislative filibuster, as some are proposing, would be devastating. Uh, I think that would be an awful thing. It would make the Senate a majoritarian institution, just like the House. Uh, the Founding Fathers, I think it was George Washington, who observed the Senate was to be the, the saucer that cooled the, the milk. Uh, the, the passions that govern sometimes the House um, would be cooled by the Senate. It has very much served that function. It's one of the very few mechanisms we still have to force the parties together. The Senate is run by either unanimous consent or supermajority. And as I mentioned, it's rare that one party has 60 votes uh, in the Senate and a majority in the House, uh, but it is quite frequent that one party controls both the House and the Senate. You might see legislation uh, that, that passes that the next change of majority two years later, four years later, they seek to reverse that legislation and you ping pong back and forth like we're doing now with health care reform. Uh, that's not good. Uh, it's better if this legislation is more uh, more wholly considered, uh, more slowly considered, and, uh, and that's how it's done with the filibuster. So I don't think we need to change those rules. We do need to change some behavior. Uh, with regard to the uh, Electoral College, I'm very much in favor of maintaining the Electoral College. Uh, it uh, sometimes produces results that uh, some people don't like, but so does the popular vote. My, my love for the Electoral College is that it emphasizes the federal nature of our system. It reminds us every election time that we are a republic, that we are a federal system, there was a great compromise, and it's more than just the traditions that have developed and the norms that we all appreciate that force candidates to actually travel uh, in states that they wouldn't travel before. That's good, but uh, the most important part is that uh, it reminds us uh, once again that uh, this is a federal system. One more. So if you could go back 10 or 18 years, I believe, to the start of your uh, political career in the Congress, uh, what's something that you would perhaps tell yourself to do differently or some advice that you would give yourself looking back now? <laughs> oh boy. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I ought to ask my wife that question. <laughs> uh, um, it, it was a good run. I mean, 18 years is a good, good time. I thought that I would go back for six years and be done with it and just stay in the house. Uh, but um, but I, I, uh, I mentioned in the book that I wrote uh, two years ago that there were a couple of regrets in how I voted. Sometimes I, there's a phenomenon sometimes more in the House than the Senate of a uh, uh, vote no, hope yes, <laughs> uh, where, where something that you know needs to pass, but in my case, often as a young member of the House, I wanted to keep this sterling voting record that I had, you know, never voting for a government subsidy or a bloated appropriation bill or whatever else. Uh, but then, you know, a big financial 
crisis comes along like we faced in 2008, where this big bloated bailout bill was presented, which nobody liked, which was just awful, frankly. Uh, but it may have been the only thing that, uh, that spared us a lot more grief and a much deeper recession. And I uh, voted uh, no and hoped yes, because there are enough of my colleagues to have it pass on the second try. And, uh, and I, I've always said after that I, I regretted that vote, that I let some of my colleagues carry my water uh, when, when I shouldn't have, and they took the grief politically for doing that. It was a very unpopular vote to take, but it was, uh, it was what needed to be done at that point, given where we were. So uh, there are a few things that I would do differently, but I have to say uh, I've lived a charmed political life. Uh, I've run seven times and uh, haven't had to, to suffer defeat yet. Uh, and uh, I would have liked to have served uh, a second term in the Senate, but uh, that would have required, in my case, to probably adopt positions that I just couldn't hold or uh, condone behavior that I would feel uncomfortable doing or, or standing on a campaign stage uh, when people are yelling, lock her up, and, and, uh, or, or the president might be ridiculing colleagues and friends of mine, and, and I would have to be okay with that, and, and I couldn't do it. Uh, so I'm, uh, I've, I've had a great uh, career, and I'm not swearing off public service. It's a noble profession. There are good people in Washington, and uh, we need to add to those ranks. Uh, but it's, it's nice to have a little breather here, at least. A long breather, Cheryl. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, thank you again for having me here. It's been an honor.